Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the OSU College of Liberal Arts and the School of History, Philosophy, and Religions Holocaust Memorial Week panel discussion about teaching the Holocaust in Oregon K through 12 schools. I'm Mike O'Malley from the College of Education and the facilitator for this event. First off, I'd like to thank our donors for making this event possible. Bedam, the OSU Foundation's Holocaust Memorial Fund, the City of Corvallis, the OSU Provost Fund for Excellence, and the Center for the Humanities. I'd also like to acknowledge the Herculean effort and relentless dedication of Professor Paul Copperman and Erin Sneller. As anyone acquainted with her knows, if you need something done around here, ask Erin. As designated by Israel's Knesset in 1951, today is Yom, Yom Hashua, also known as Holocaust Remembrance Day. It marks the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943, when Jewish freedom fighters defied the Nazis and fought genocidal tyranny. Yom Hashua has traditionally commemorated with speeches, ceremonies, moments of silence, prayers, and testimonials. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism didn't end in 1951. It seethes on in our contemporary world as evidenced in part by the reported rise in hate crimes against American Jews. Disquietingly, a majority of American Jews say they feel less safe than they used to. Given this climate of fear, intolerance, and violence, the need for effective, robust, and meaningful Holocaust education is as urgent now as it ever was. With all that said, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists, educators who have dedicated their professional lives to developing transformative K through 12 Holocaust curriculum. Amit Dobrowski, the K through 12 social science specialist at the Oregon Department of Agri uh, Education. Uh, Amanda Coven, the director of education at the Oregon Jewish Museum and the Center for Holocaust Education. June Morris, a language arts slash social study teacher, social studies teacher at West Albany High School. And Carrie McCallum, a language, art, language arts teacher at St. Helens High School. Amit will discuss state legislation about the teaching of the Holocaust in Oregon K through 12 at schools. Amanda will discuss educational resources available at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. And June and Carrie will discuss approaches they take to effectively teach the Holocaust and what challenges they experience in the classroom. After our four presentations, I will facilitate a Q&A between our panelists and the audience. So feel free to type questions into our chat room at any time. Our first speaker this evening is Amit Kabrowski, the K through 12 social science specialist at the Oregon Department of Education. Welcome Amit. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Amit Kabrowski and I am the Oregon uh, social science specialist at the Department of Education. And I was gonna share with you my screen. So just give me a moment here. Um, and just take you through sort of where we are as far as um, supporting uh, the Holocaust and other genocides bill, SB 664. Um, so hopefully you're seeing my screen at this point. Okay, so what we have here is, um, as, as the others will, will mention, um, when the Holocaust bill passed, um, you know, really put us in a, in a position of needing to figure out how to support something that wasn't quite standards yet. Um, it wasn't a curriculum. It didn't include lesson plans or even instructional materials. It was really just this idea that um, we wanted Oregon social science teachers to teach these sort of learning concepts that were identified in the bill itself. And there are, there are nine learning concepts there. Um, and the way the timing of the bill works is that um, we have until the year 25 um, to sort of be in the support role. And then as we open up the new standard cycle, as we do every seven years, new social science standards will come along and we'll be uh, integrating these concepts into the new social science standards, along with some other bills that you've probably heard of, which is uh, SB 13, which is the travel history, shared history, uh, ethnic studies uh, is also part of this sort of integrated model for our next uh, social sort of science cycle. So that's all to say that um, right now we're sort of in flux with all these pieces. SB 13, the travel history, shared history, has lesson plans. Ethnic studies has standards. And the Holocaust and Genocide Education Bill has um, these learning concepts. So if you're looking for inf more information about this, I want to show you something that not a lot of teachers go to, but maybe will be a chance to, to check it out. This is our, our landing page at ODE, the Oregon Department of Education. So if you were to type in ODE, uh, 
you might get or you might get Ohio, but hopefully you'll type in Oregon Department of Education um, and you'll see this page. And then when you click on that educator resource button or picture, um, there'll be something there right below it for standards. And then um, you can click on social science. And when you get to the social science page, um, you'll see this this Holocaust uh, and genocide um, bar. This page is, as you can tell, horribly dated and, um, you know, maybe 10 years old of technology. We are in the process of updating it as we speak. So it, it may look different um, by the start of next week, actually. But for right now, it's um, the Holocaust genocide button is there at the bottom. But you'll see to the left of it uh, is uh, ethnic studies and then some other places that you can click uh, if you're looking for more information on those places. So taking you through that, we have then um, a, a few resources there that have already been created uh, at the Department of Education, uh, working along with the Oregon Jewish Museum um, to, to think about the ways in which teachers might approach the teaching of these learning concepts. And the most important one, I think, for tonight um, is the, the grade level guidance. And so, and so you see that here, the kind of the third button down. And when you click on the grade level guidance, what you'll get is um, a sort of uh, crosswalk document that will take you through as you're teaching social science standards K-12, right? And it's kind of important to keep in mind that this uh, law is for kindergarten through high school. Um, as you're thinking about what you're doing with your social science class or, or your time for social science in, in third grade, um, what standards are you able to hit? Right, what standards are you able to address? And so um, on the left hand side of the column, I just show I'm just showing one page here um, is the first of the learning concepts. Um, and this is to prepare students to confront the immorality of the Holocaust and other genocides. Um, and so that's a concept that's, you know, um, probably not uh, ready for kindergarten and, and first and second and third grade. But when we start getting into our, our fourth grade history, which is going to be um, Oregon history, uh, history of Oregon tribes, um, then we do have the concepts of genocide that come up in those fourth grade standards. And so as you address these topics, you could look back at the social science standards that are, in this case, the 2018 standards, and, uh, and think about how you're reaching to those standards. And so you would want to, of course, teach to them and then assess to those, to those standards. And so as you go through this document, if you went through all the pages, what you would see is sort of like which grade level, in this case, it's fourth grade and fifth grade, as well as eighth grade and high school. So there's a number of places where you can hit these standards. And then as you go through the entire document, I think it's 10 or 11 pages long, the last page is sort of the, is the overview page. And so you can see where each of the um, concepts, which are sort of labeled A through I, where they're addressed in the social science standards by grade level, right? So Concept A, the one we just looked at, um, there are five opportunities to sort of look at that learning concept, as well as uh, some of the social science standards, where uh, something like uh, the second one, B, is, is hit 13 times, right? There's a number of times where that kind of threw out from kindergarten all the way through high school, they can address that learning concept. So um, just kind of the last piece here is thinking about the timeline of all three of these things in just sort of a visual format. Um, and what should be happening in our social science classrooms already. With SB 13, our tribal history piece, um, we had a rollout for that uh, at the beginning of the year 2019, a sort of soft rollout where lessons in, in fourth grade and eighth grade and high school were made available, not just in social science, but also in um, the other content areas. So for ELA, for math, science, and health, there were also lessons there. Um, with the start of COVID, which was supposed to be the, you know, the 20, 20 school year was supposed to be kind of the full rollout, but because of COVID, we kind of kept it on a soft rollout phase. Um, and so teachers who have been able to use those um, lesson plans have really responded really positively uh, around using those. And now we are in the process of um, releasing some additional lesson plans, um, both for the, the original fourth, eighth, and 10th, but also for the other grades in between. So you'll start to see um, fifth grade lessons and ninth grade lessons and third grade lessons um, coming out in different content areas. Uh, and right now we're working on some ninth grade and sixth grade social science lessons. So hopefully those will be out before the uh, next school year. So that's happening. Uh, and again, that one is, is sort of our biggest bill in that it covers all the content areas. And then um, the Holocaust and other genocides that we're talking about today, um, 
you should begin to instruct on this. Um, you know, ideally now you've been doing this again with COVID sort of <laughs> idea of a soft rollout. We know that there's sort of a patchwork of teachers who are trying some of the things out. We've got a great group of teachers working directly with the Oregon Jewish Museum. Uh, another group of teachers who have been working, uh, I, from what I hear, with Oregon State. So, um, so people are trying these things out. Um, and uh, as we move forward here, we are working with districts who are interested in, in um, training their teachers. The Oregon Jewish Museum is doing a fabulous job creating materials to help train teachers and have already hosted, Amanda will talk about this quite a bit, uh, already hosted a number of opportunities for teachers. Hopefully you've been able to take advantage of those. And then we'll move into that required implementation stage. And then again, with the ethnic studies, we just passed ethnic studies in February of uh, 2021. We have the standards available. They're on that web page that I showed you. They're uh, optional right now. So uh, we have some school districts that will be taking those on starting in September of 21, uh, but you are not required as a school district to use those until September of 26. And so that's a pretty big gap. Uh, there is a piece of uh, legislation right now in front of the Senate um, that if it does pass would provide money uh, for schools to train their teachers who are interested in um, starting early on ethnic studies. In other words, starting sometime between September 21 and September 26. So we're sort of working towards those things. But the reason I show these things together, and you might have seen some other um, pieces of information from ODE that, that show this in a different visual format, but basically, there's a lot of overlap between these three pieces of legislation. There's a lot of overlap in what kids will be understanding about um, Oregon history, uh, world history, U.S. history. You know, there, there are some connections there. Uh, Amanda and myself and um, then our Office of Indian Education will be presenting to um, OEA uh, for some summer workshops and sort of talking about the, the nexus of these three uh, pieces of legislation uh, and where they overlap. And, you know, the, the most obvious one, I think, is on this concept of sort of like hard history and genocide. Um, and that's, you know, fundamentally what, what people will focus on. But there's also these connections around uh, issues of resistance and resilience um, and reparations. So there's a number of places here where we can talk about um, how these connect. And hopefully you'll be able to do that in your classroom as well, right? And taking advantage of some of these you know, local training opportunities, opportunities with the museum, opportunities through ODE um, to, to, to kind of get yourself ready to, to teach these things when you're, when you feel comfortable. So having said all that, I think that's, uh, if there's no other, no questions here, I just want to show you one more uh, piece here. And that is um, what's changed with our ethnic studies. Um, so prior to 2019, um, when the, when the law passed, um, the word genocide was not in our standards. The word Holocaust is not in our 2018 standards. Um, and so that's partially part, maybe part of the reason why we have the Holocaust bill in the first place, right? As, as, as a, uh, a lay person looking at our standards, where do they teach the Holocaust? It was not clear from looking at our standards where that might be. Um, so um, although the word Holocaust does not appear in the ethnic studies standards right now, the 2021 standards, the word genocide has been added in fourth grade, eighth grade and high school. And then, like I said, the um, the next cycle will open up that um, opportunity to look at all the standards again. And so we'll be able to put in some of the concepts from 664 uh, at that point, right? So um, so if you're a teacher out there right now um, and you're thinking that you wanna be part of this, when we, um, we write standards, we invite teachers to participate in that process, either by being on the committee, um, and that's usually a, a two-year commitment, um, uh, and so you can come and do that, or you can be part of that sort of review piece afterwards and provide your feedback uh, as a classroom educator and, and say like how you feel about these standards. So there's a number of ways to comment. Is it, like I said, a two-year process? So um, if you're looking at my newsletter, you'll be getting updates about that as we go forward. Thank you, Amit. Yes. That was great. Um, our second speaker is uh, Amanda Coven, the Director of Education at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust um, studies. Um, yeah, take it away, Amanda. And I'm going to go over today with you really, really briefly some of the resources and opportunities that we have a bit that that we have for you um, at the museum. So I broke it down into two different um, topic areas. So for the classroom and then for for teachers 
in, in particular. So for the classroom, right now, I totally understand that I can't come into your classroom, you can't come to me. So we have created virtual visits where we come to you virtually through Zoom. Uh, we've done about 35, um, 35 virtual visits so far, and we've transitioned really nicely into doing hybrid um, visits as well. So if you are teaching and you are going back to hybrid, know that we can absolutely still come to your classroom. And I would say that the law and order and resistance during the Holocaust are perfect for hybrid. Although I did just do the how and why I did it three times this week for hybrid and that went really well. So these are four different topics that you can choose from and a museum educator can come into your come into your classroom and speak with your students and run these lessons. If you teach more than one class, we can come more than one time. So um, know that that option is open to you if you had wanted to work with other teachers and combine classes virtually. If you are all online, we can do that too. So we're trying to, to be as flexible as we can, knowing that this year is a wild ride for everyone. We have our speakers bureau as well, who I am so grateful learned how to use Zoom about five months prior to the pandemic. So they are all pretty fluent in Zoom. So if you want a speaker to come and visit and speak with your students, that is always an option. If you teach multiple classes, we have had teachers meet with speakers and record it and then show it to the entire grade level. So again, we're really trying to be open to whatever your needs are. Next year, we will have five to seven page, um, five to seven page presentation summaries uh, for classes um, where our speakers have written down their, their, their personal histories. Um, and so if you don't have the opportunity to, to, to host a speaker, or if you want to have students read multiple histories, that will be um, new to all of you next year. We also have an, an oral history collection where you can hear uh, survivors who are no longer with us um, as well. So that is always a great resource to know about. This was new this year, it launched in January. So we have a virtual tour. Um, it is completely self-guided and self-paced. It is free to everybody. You can access it on our website. If you want the teacher's guide, you just have to fill out a really simple request form. Um, and so that comes with a, a, that comes with a student graphic organizer um, and, a, and a discussion guide. We've had really great feedback on this from teachers. So if you are from outside the, the, the Portland metro area, this is a really good option for you. We also have a digital experience of our discrimination and resistance, um, our, our discrimination and resistance exhibition. This is one of our core exhibitions at the museum that looks at, at at Oregon history. Um, it was designed for students in grades six through 12, though we have had teachers in grades three, four, and five request it. And you just have to use it more with your students rather than letting them, letting them ex explore it on their own. Uh, this also comes with a, a teacher's guide and it allows you to examine this like dynamic relationship between um, groups that have had groups that have been discriminated against in in Oregon and how they, they have resisted. So rather than looking at it on this like first groups were oppressed, then they then they resisted and and everything got better. That's not how history goes. It is um, more dynamic than that. This is also free to everybody. You can access it for the entire year. Um, the link will no longer be valid once the school year ends. We will use your feedback to um, make changes over the summer, and then you can request it in September again for the entire next year. 
hopefully next year we'll be able to see you in person. I really hope that we can. Um, but when we are open in person, we do do tours as well for up to two, up to 150 students at a time. Um, if you do bring that many students, it is a three hour program. Otherwise, you can opt for a 90 minute program. You can extend with a workshop or speaker, um, but the tours are really, really engaging. June and Carrie have both been on tours with our museum, so they can talk about it more in their sessions if they want to, but know that I really hope that we can see you all next year. It makes me so sad that I can't see you in person yet. If you are unable to come next year, we are looking at doing workshops in the classroom. So if I'm able to come into the classroom, we're looking at training our docents to be able to run those in person with you. So again, we're really trying to meet you where you're at. Um, another thing that we have for the classroom is lessons. So these are not on our website yet, but they will be next September. So we're starting with these six lessons and then we'll be adding to them yearly. But know that there are so many fabulous resources out there that I'm sure June and Carrie will both mention. Um, our lessons, we really try to, to um, talk about how they, how our, our, huh, how our local survivors um, have been a, affected by this history. Oh, one other thing I should mention that's really exciting for us. We are adding speakers from Cambodia and, and, uh, and, and Rwanda to our speakers bureau next year. So that's very exciting that we are expanding our speakers beyond the Holocaust. Lastly, for the classroom, we have our our art and and writing competition. Um, the competition just closed this past for this past year in March, but know that we have one every single year. The winners, so there's one grand prize winner for art and one for writing, get a trip to Washington D.C. for themselves, um, a caretake a caretaker and their teacher. So. That's a big push for all of you if you want a free trip to Washington, DC. So now for educators, what is out there specifically for you? We do a lot of PDs. Well, this past Saturday, I think was the 29th PD that I've done this year. So we have our last upcoming one for the year on peace building. Um, so that is Wednesday, April 21st. You can get all the information on our website. I'll be presenting at the OEA conference, and then we're going to be doing a week um, on the, the week of August 16th. We're going to do some um, a, a full week of PDs that kind of unpack this bill. So it'll be actually have, I'm going to go backwards. It's actually a lot of them on here. So teaching the bill in, in K-5, teaching the bill in six through 12. Um, so these are a lot of these lessons are all, sorry, some of these PDs will be um, that week of August 16th. So you can look out for that. It's not on, on our website yet, but um, we really wanna help teachers get the, the foundations. We're also available to come to your school. So if you want us to come to your school or your district, uh, let us know. And we can do that. If you live or work outside of, of the Portland metro area, all PDs are free. We got a really nice um, grant from a, from a donor, and they are covering the cost of all PDs for any, any, any school or district outside of the, the Portland metro area. Just going to go back for a second. We have our first first fellowship opportunity this summer. So this is a new program that we're doing that we hope to continue next year. Um, we'll see how it goes. And we'll hope that, we'll, that, that we will do it next year. But this is something new that we're doing this summer for 10 teachers. So very much looking forward to what that program has to offer. And then finally, our tab. So this is a two-year commitment. 
Um, we're finishing our first year. So at the end of next year, um, if you are interested, you can fill out an, an application. But our tab meets um, one hour a month via Zoom. So if you live far away from the museum, that's great. Just so, join us on Zoom. Uh, and they help us with lesson plans, with pretty much everything and, and anything, planning PDs, just giving us feedback on what is going on in the schools, which is what's been uh, th this year quite a quite a a lot. Um, but yeah, so we look forward to really hearing from teachers and what they need, so we can better support you. And then finally. Uh, if you visit us on our website, we have lots of resources available. So these are just some of the things. Uh, so especially if you are starting off with teaching, uh, these are just some guides that you may find helpful for you as you begin. Otherwise, I think that's it for me and I look forward to hearing your questions at the end. Thank you, Amanda. Um, our third speaker is Jude Morris a language arts slash social studies teacher at West Albany High School and a former colleague of mine. So uh, welcome, June. Thank you. So um, as Mike said, I teach social studies at West Albany High School. I have been a language arts teacher in the past. I currently teach world history and AP European history. So I have an opportunity to teach about the Holocaust. But um, I, I, I I guess what drew me to um, Amanda's Museum, it's more than Amanda's Museum, but that's how I always refer to it, the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. Um, what drew me to that location was um, the PD that Amanda spoke about. And as I just started going to uh, PD at the museum, I realized that even as a history teacher, I didn't know very much. Um, I knew more than my students, but I didn't, I didn't really think very much about the nuances of the Holocaust and how it tied into the bigger picture. And so my students come to me with knowing like two things. They know that 6 million people died, 6 million Jews, and that they already know everything about the Holocaust. And so um, I really took it upon myself about two years ago to really start to understand the connect the interconnection of the Holocaust and genocide, uh, studying the Holocaust as an example of genocide to the other topics that I cover. So um, I would really, I just want to put in, I mean, not even a shameless plug for the OJM CHE because it's a fabulous resource. resource. And I'm also on the teacher advisory board and that's a really enriching opportunity. Um, I've been able to help flesh out some ideas for lessons that I get to pilot in my classroom. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about two of those lessons that I've used this year. So um, the Holocaust um, is usually a spring topic for, for me in my classes because teaching history, we tend to go chronologically. And so the last two years have been disrupted with, with uh, COVID and pandemic learning. So it really forced me to even think about, I, my knowledge of the Holocaust and genocide had expanded so dramatically. So I had to really think about what I could offer to my students very specifically. So, um, I know that we were asked to talk about some of the challenges and of teaching the Holocaust and what are some of the what are some of the strategies. So mostly I wanted my students to understand that there is no simple answer for anything that they need to think about. I think beyond just the simple narrative. If you look at a textbook, there's a very there's there's a lot of really good information about the Holocaust that's hard to deny, but some of it can give a student, especially if you're short on time, it can give a student a very simplistic definition. And um, so that was one of the challenges was to get my students to think in a more complex way to see relevance to taking the, what they knew to be true about the Holocaust and expanding it. So um, there's a couple things that I think that I've learned even before these last two pandemic years where I had to be very selective in what I taught is that I always took the strategy and I still do. I think it's really important to think to let students understand the really long history of anti-Semitism in Europe, um, that um, anti-Semitism didn't just happen in some time in the 1930s with Hitler. And so I try to really build from the, the medieval era onward, this long history, the medieval era, the role of the Catholic church, um, the Protestant reformation, the enlightenment, 
all these ideas that can feed into 20th century and 21st century anti-Semitism, this idea of growing nationalism and this idea of othering, scapegoating other people. I think that that's really important for students to have an in-depth knowledge is if, if they have that, that understanding that it's not just an isolated incident. We don't just take out the Holocaust for a couple weeks and teach it and then pack it up and put it away again. So um, that's one thing that I, one strategy that I think is, is pretty important. And I also think that before we start to teach lessons about the Holocaust, it is important for students to understand that to be Jewish in Europe or to be Jewish anywhere is not a homogenous sort of situation that, that um, for Jewish communities in Euro Europe historically and during the 20th century, that there was that idea of dual identity, that they were both German and Jewish and French and Jewish, and, and that communities had varying degrees of assimilation, but mostly that Jewish communities were people who experienced the same highs and lows and joys and sadnesses of, of other groups that we study. So um, that's where I start with the Holocaust education. And then um, the last couple of years when I've been a little bit shorter on time, but want to provide a high quality education, I've relied upon four lessons. Um, I relied upon facing history as a tremendous resource for the Holocaust and genocide. I've also relied upon um, um, some lesson ideas from the Oregon Jewish Museum and also of course the US Holocaust Museum. And so um, I'm just gonna throw out a couple lessons and if you want to know more, I can definitely type into the chat later where you can find um, the basis for these lessons, or I'm also happy to share anything that I have created with anybody else, of course. Being a teacher, I've borrowed from people and I'm happy to give back. So uh, Facing History has a really good lesson about the universe of obligation, which encourages and challenges students to think about who they feel an obligation to. And um, as, since I teach 14 and 15 year olds, they can be a little bit narcissistic, so they don't oftentimes think about um, their, they don't think very far beyond themselves and what's right in front of their face. So challenging them to think about who do they owe an obligation to? Who would they lay down their life for? Well, I mean, most of us would say our friends and family, um, very, you know, very emphatically. But by digging a little bit deeper, asking students what kind of obligation they have to other people in their community, it start, I think it starts them thinking about how they, they may not feel they have an obligation to the state, for example, but the state, they certainly feel that the state has an obligation to them to be protected. And so we start to maybe uncover some uncomfortable questions at that point. Um, once we start with the Holocaust, I think it's really useful for them to understand how um, the history of anti-Semitism was a real thing, but also the laws that the Nazi regime imposed upon the Jews of Europe, of Germany, um, were also a very real thing. And so there was this slow, gradual, but then very, you know, very thorough development of laws that limited the rights and privileges of Jews. But by asking students to analyze these lessons, the, these laws, and this is a lesson from the Oregon Jewish Museum, so I'm, I'm glad to say this is an awesome lesson, but um, it really shows students that in ways that they didn't expect that the rights of Jews were limited. So like every, all the students know that they had to wear a yellow star and they got deported and they went to camps, but they didn't know that like their telephone lines were severed to their houses and that they were only allowed to shop a, a few hours a day or they couldn't act or perform in public. And so they start to really see what it means to be an other and how a lot of times Jews in German cities, for example, became essentially invisible. And then it was a lot easier to notice, not, to notice or not notice that they were gone. Um, I also like to teach a lesson about the Lodge Ghetto that I taught this year to, um, that was a way to show resistance and resilience. If you know about the Lodge Ghetto, you know that um, Heinrich Ross was the photographer who took a whole bunch of photos of, of um, Jewish families, you know, laughing and celebrating marriages and births and hugging their babies close and children skipping and holding hands going to school. Um, and he did that as a form of resistance to say, hey, we're still here. And it was a form of resistance for him to do that. I did have an unintended consequence this year. I um, asked students to analyze the photos and I was really quite shocked that with 80 students, I think I had about a half dozen that said, wow, I see people smiling and happy. It must not have been so bad to be Jewish in a ghetto. And so that was totally, I can see Carrie putting her hands over her face. That was my reaction too. Um, so there are some unique challenges, despite how much you try to get people, your students to see the humanity in, the, in people, 
they still sometimes seek that simple narrative because it feels good to them. So I think I was able to correct that, but it was shocking. Anyway, I wanna leave room for Carrie to speak too, but I just wanna say that when I'm done teaching about the Holocaust, I find it really useful to um, talk about the 10 stages of genocide. Maybe many of you have heard about that before, but it allows students to make sense of how genocide has happened before and it will happen again, and it is happening. Um, oppression and discrimination, bias, hate, those are things that are happening anywhere around the world um, at so many different times and places. And so um, seeing the 10 stages allows them, we can use the Holocaust, we can reflect back and see, we can see those stages so clearly in the Holocaust. So now we can apply them to Rwanda or Bosnia or any other place historically in the past, in the present and in between. And um, so anyway, the, that in a nutshell, that is, that is my approach to teaching the Holocaust. And I'm sure that Carrie's gonna add a lot more detail as well. And I'm eager to hear any questions you might have a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, June. And last but not least, our fourth speaker is Carrie McCallum, a, uh, I, I presume a language arts teacher at St. Ellen's High School. Uh, Carrie, take it away. Hi, yes, I'm Carrie McCollum. I teach at St. Helens High School. I am a language arts teacher. Uh, I have been teaching Holocaust and genocide history for about 18 years now. Um, my introduction to the subject actually came in a ninth grade language arts class when I was given the book Night to Teach to Ninth Graders. And I had never read it before. And I knew about the Holocaust. I had studied it somewhat but it was not something that I was an expert in and I felt very overwhelmed in a lot of ways being handed this book and not knowing a whole lot about what I should do with it. So I actually reached out at that time to what was then the Oregon Holocaust Resource Center to get a speaker from the Speakers Bureau and was introduced to a lovely man named Alter Wiener who lived in Hillsborough. He came to my school and he spoke to my students and he basically changed my life. Um, at that point, like I said, I had never met a Holocaust survivor. He was um, a very gracious man and he, my students were enthralled by him and so was I. And that started me on this journey in Holocaust education where I had to learn more and I had to include more in my classroom. At that time, we didn't have anything uh, in Oregon that addressed Holocaust education. So I had to travel to the other side of the country to get my professional development that helped me learn more about this subject and how to best teach it. So I went to places like the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, went to trainings there, went to another organization called the Olga Lingwell Institute, and I got lots of training and eventually got even more training when I got the chance to go overseas. And since then, I have also traveled to Rwanda um, to learn about the genocide there with people who survived that genocide. So my own odyssey has been quite something. Um, and I am so excited for all the resources that we now have in Oregon. It's amazing for me to see this. It's been such a major development in the last several years and I'm very excited by it. Um, as far as teaching and what I have um, encountered, it's been a very mixed bag. I teach now a Holocaust and genocide elective for seniors. Um, it is a semester elective. It is something that is completely of my own creation. It was nothing that I had handed to me. It was something I had to develop, but it's been my passion for the last seven years, I think it is. No, it's actually more than that. It's 10 years. And it's been a labor of love because it is a lot of work and it is very emotional, but I love it absolutely. And it has brought me to people like Amanda and Amit, because these are people that I met doing this work and actually Mike through his wife. <laughs> and so it's been a crazy adventure, but I wanna share some things that I had to develop over the years as people asked me why I was teaching this and how I was doing it and what I needed. So I actually am going to share my screen as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna share part of a presentation that I put together um, a while back that was about teaching the Holocaust and some of the things that I've learned through doing this and um, what I need to remember about teaching this subject, teaching this history. So one of the things is that I need to strive for balance in establishing whose perspective informs my study of the Holocaust and my student's study of the Holocaust. Um, what value would there be in examining in this photograph that's hopefully on the screen? Can everybody see that hopefully? Um, 
examining the bystander perspective, how might that perspective differ from the victim's perspective or the perpetrator's perspective? It is something that I did not initially do when I started teaching this is talking about what's going on in the picture, who's taking the photograph. If you look at some of the faces of the people who seem to be posing for the picture, and then what's happening in the center, what is actually going on. Having those conversations um, in, with students in a classroom is sometimes not easy, but it is so important because they, they don't notice everything necessarily that they should notice about these pictures. So that's part of it. Sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. Um, I also encourage everyone to use a variety of sources and formats of information. I use this poem from Pastor Martin Neumuller about first they came for the socialists. There's many iterations of this, by the way. Um, and then I also use a children's book called Terrible Things and a poem called The Hangman by a British poet that was along the same lines. So using those different resources gives students different access points to the information that we're trying to share and sometimes gives them a different impression and they understand it differently depending on the resource that is being used. Um, and these are pretty readily available. Um, I also encourage everyone to make very careful choices about the texts that you use or the, even just the resources that you use. Um, the boy in the striped pajamas is something that is very widely used, but I would encourage people to think about what is the text conveying, the message you want students to get from it, it isn't always what you think it is. Um, as June mentioned, with the lesson about photographs and what students took away from it, that's the same thing that kind of happens in the boy in the striped pajamas. Um, it is something that I would never teach, but they teach it at my middle school. And so we have to unpack everything that relates to that book when, they, when we talk about it at the high school level and what they have learned, what they have taken away from it is very different. Um, the other thing to, of course, think about is that is the text appropriate for the age and maturity of your students? Um, depending on what level you're teaching, I know that you know, the bill obviously goes down to kindergarten, but as Amit talked about, not everything about the standards is appropriate for every grade level. And so really paying attention to the way it has been broken down um, would be very helpful. I'm so glad that they did that. Um, so that you're at the student's developmental level when you are teaching certain aspects of this history and not going beyond what is comfortable, what is cognitively appropriate for them and emotionally appropriate for them. So making sure you're careful about resources. Um, also being careful about your use of, I'm trying to get this to change, your use of time. Um, I know a lot of people that tend to show things like all of Schindler's List, and that takes a lot of time in a classroom. I am not somebody who tends to do that because I have so many things that I try to cram into my Holocaust units and lessons that I can't take the time out of class to show my students a movie like that. And I don't necessarily think it is the best use of my class time, but I might use a clip or a short film like the one that's there on the screen called Toyland which was an Academy Award for Best Live Action Short Film in 2009. Um, but getting kids to think about things or even using clips from movies just to think about certain concepts or ideas that you're presenting is really helpful. Another thing is to think about the content and appropriateness of films if you're going to use them. I put Rwandan films on here just because these, again, are movies that have been have come up in my school. The movie Hotel Rwanda is shown to our ninth graders when they discuss um, different aspects of Africa and African history, which I have discouraged them from using because when I had a chance to actually visit Rwanda, it presented a very different, uh, the people there presented a very different account of um, the history. And so I wanna make sure that of course the film is appropriate again, for the age and maturity of the students, but also that it's preventing and presenting an accurate and truthful account of the history. Um, we need to be sensitive to appropriate content that maintains a safe environment. An idea that comes out in my classroom is safe in and safe out. I want students to feel safe going into this subject, but then also safe coming out, that they are not completely disturbed and gonna have you know, nightmares and that these things are gonna sit heavily with them. So that idea, not presenting pictures that are graphic, that show piles of dead bodies or something like that, they don't need that. They don't need us to expose them to it. They can go and find that on their own if they really want to. And so I'm very deliberate in my choices about images that I use. And I try not to 
traumatize students, I guess I would say, and make them remember the hor the horrific images of the Holocaust and other genocides because they don't need us to do that for them. And I wanna make sure that all of my students are taken care of wherever they're at. I also want to complicate students thinking. Um, this is one of the guiding principles in my classroom. I wanna make sure that we maintain the humanity of all groups, that rescuers don't become saints and perpetrators aren't demons. We tend to, as humans, try to put people in little boxes and leave them there. And of course, these people are complicated people. They are fully dimensional, three-dimensional, and we need to present them as such. So we do an activity in my class that is about um, the faces of the people that are on the next couple of slides. This man right here, some of you may recognize, Heydrich. He was in charge of the final solution, creating the you know, the all the ideas around the final solution and yet he was a family man with several kids and a wife um, so we have to present him as more than just this demonized nazi in our minds um, same thing when you look at a kids have um, preconceived notions about the people that are part of this history a lot of them will recognize the stylized ss on the collar of this soldier this soldier actually was named Kurt Gerstein and he ended up trying, he ended up going into camps to try to figure out his sister-in-law, I believe it was, was um, euthanized. And he wanted to figure out if this euthanasia program was actually happening. So he joined the SS to figure that out and then tried to inform the world about what was going on and didn't end up being successful. But someone in an SS uniform, we automatically assume is somebody who is quote unquote a bad guy. Um, and that wasn't the case here. Then we also have, if you look at just the picture on the left, my students think, oh, she must have been a victim of the Holocaust. And they make these very hard and fast distinctions about people who are part of this history and they don't wanna change their minds. This woman was named Irma Greasy and she was a guard, um, very vicious guard who actually was um, in the Nuremberg trials after the war and was hanged. Um, so she definitely presents a different picture on the left than on the right. Um, the other thing, don't romanticize history to try to gauge, engage students' interest. Um, if we try to romanticize and only talk about rescuers, yes, we're showing them good examples of humanity, um, but it also skews their view of it. We don't want them to come away thinking that all people who lived in that time are rescuers um, or had the opportunity to be. So we want to make sure we present, again, a balanced idea um, and a picture of history that actually matches what happened. Um, translate statistics into people. This is one of my top ones, I guess, when I'm teaching this history. It's all about personalization. So I use the Speakers Bureau. Amanda mentioned that I've worked with them. Yes, I take students there every year. I was very sad I didn't get to take my students last year, and I won't get to take my students this year either in person because it's a day that my students value so much. Um, we have access to the memorial because we're about an hour away from Portland, we can make a day trip of it and go into the memorial. We also have had the distinct pleasure of hearing um, some of our survivors and other people on the Speakers Bureau um, talk. And then also now being able to tour the OJM CHE with students and see the exhibits there. It's been a wonderful experience and it helps translate statistics into people and the people are what my students remember. Um, they remember these survivors, they remember the individual stories, and that's what makes a difference to them. Also, selecting appropriate learning activities, I've already touched on this, but there are so many things that can go terribly wrong. Um, so you want to really make sure you're selecting appropriate activities. There are so many resources, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Avoid comparisons of pain. Um, one genocide is not worse than another. They're all terrible. Um, you can't judge someone's pain against someone else's. And so thinking about that, um, there is no way to compare pain. Um, and then of course, reinforcing the objectives of your lessons to make them relevant to students learning in lives today. Students are aware of some of the history of this country. So actually relating it to what happened in the past. You can see in this, these two pictures, one is of a bus um, from the South. The other one is from a train in Europe at the time. So it's one of those things that you can relate it in different ways and make it just reinforce the ideas. Um, this again, reinforcing the objectives of the lesson to make it relevant um, by discussing other genocides or in a larger context. Um, it didn't just happen once. And this picture that is on this page, I actually took when I was in Rwanda and it breaks my heart every time I read it. 
um, because Rwandans felt like the world was turning away from them and that they weren't important um, when the genocide was happening there in the 90s. And so talking about these different events, and now, of course, we can contextualize it by talking about what's happening in different places in the world today. Um, this lesson is from Facing History, and it has um, definitely, it uses this image, and I really encourage you to use this lesson. Um, it's a wonderful lesson on the Rohingya and what is happening there. There are so many good lessons out there. Um, and connecting to current events by discussing just what's happening, encouraging students to learn more about some of the places in the world that are experiencing genocide um, or are in danger of experiencing genocide. And of course, just learning yourselves more about what's going on. Um, these are amazing organizations that I have had the pleasure of working with in various ways over the years. The Olga Langwell Institute, which I mentioned, it has an Oregon satellite seminar that I run. Um, I and Rob Hadley, another teacher who used to live here in Oregon, run a summer seminar at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education that talks about the Holocaust, other genocides, and Japanese American incarceration during World War II. So we would love it if you would join us. We are still accepting applications. And so if you want to participate in that, it's a week long in the summer. It's going to be uh, the first week in August this year, so I have to put my plug in. Um, but the Oregon Jewish Museum, I can't recommend them enough for ways that they can help you. There is the Portland State University Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, um, the USHMM Yad Vashem. I can send this out or send it to Mike and he can send it out to participants if he can do that. Um, but there are so many ways for you to engage in professional development that relates to this topic now. And it's such a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us to continue to develop this. And so I am more than happy to answer questions and can be in contact with anybody who needs um, resources or suggestions. And that is me. Thank you so much. Well, it's now time for uh, the Q&A. If the, anybody in the audience has any questions, you can enter them on the chat and um, I can ask the panelists and um, we'll take it from there. So uh, the first question is, uh, well, I'll just go from the take, I'll take it from the top. Um, I think this has to do with Amanda. What's the timeline and prompt for the writing competition? The prompt typically comes out December-ish and then um, all submissions are due end of March mid by mid-April. So somewhere around that timeline. Okay, thanks. Um, Here's another great question. Um, regarding challenges, have any of you had encounters with children of anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers? I, I know you know this was coming. If so, how do you work with uh, these circumstances and people? I'll let June and Carrie talk about the classroom, but we just had a professional development last Wednesday on confronting conspiracy theories in the classroom that was really, really helpful for this. So you can always go to our YouTube page and watch the, the recording of that PD. Um, and then if you wanna email me, I'll put my, um, my email in the chat, but I have, um, I made a guide for confronting conspiracy theories that I can send out to you that just has some helpful links and resources um, and things in there in case this is happening. Anybody else on that uh, question? Well, I think that more than Holocaust deniers is like Holocaust minimizers or Holocaust detractors. I have students every year who they find the remote corners of the internet, they find these, they find false information, they find very biased information. They, I mean, it's just, it's really awful information and they want to make something of it and they want to distract the conversation. And, and I mean, we could speculate for a long time about why that seems acceptable to do. But um, I found, I mean, since it's going to happen, it's just about the strategy to just ask them back. Like, why do you think that? Or, you know, like, how might you have how might you have felt if this were true or something like that? Not asking how they would feel if they were um, um, a, a victim of the Holocaust, but just like how might you feel if people were saying that about you? And what where did, how how could you find different information? And if you felt differently, what evidence might you use to support that 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 feeling? So I guess um, interrogating my students back when they come with, when they want to interrogate me is a strategy. 
Thank you. Another Carrie, thing I can see you want to say something. I do. Another thing that I like to do is I, I use a lot of primary sources in my teaching. And when you use primary sources, when you talk about uh, several of those sources that I use, of course, come from the perpetrators themselves. And when you talk about these sources, I think it gives students a different perspective where they look at it and they go, well, how can you argue with that? I also do talk about it somewhat. And I have used the movie Denial. If you have never seen that movie, it's a wonderful movie that was made um, about the Holocaust denial trial that happened with Deborah Lipstadt. She's amazing. Um, I use her website. We actually do look at a couple of claims because my students generally come in knowing something about Anne Frank. And since Anne Frank is someone that deniers tend to attack, we actually do spend a little bit of time in my class talking about the concept of Holocaust denial and how it shows up. Um, and my students generally are appalled to learn about Holocaust denial when they, especially when we get to the end of our unit about the Holocaust, they usually look at me and say, how could anybody say that this didn't happen? Um, so it's not something honestly that I have to deal with a lot because they just understand after having studied it that it's pretty out there as far as the theory is concerned. So that's kind of how I, combat it is just being proactive and using as much real, you know, primary source history as I can. And, and just to add a little bit to that, um, you know, the responses of what we're hearing, like kind of the, the techniques that you want to do in the classroom beforehand. One of the things that uh, I encountered when I was a teacher in teaching this is, is on occasion you would get pushback from a family who uh, is from Germany, right? And so, and, and they're, understanding of, of what their grandparents did or great grandparents did or, or, or their um, comfort with looking at um, the way that the Nazi party sort of took over Germany, that was very hard for them at the time. Um, and so it's really important to have good administrators. I found it really important to have good administrative support to talk to your administrator about what you're doing and, and the purpose of your, your lessons. I think that that's helpful. Um, but, you know, now 25 years later, um, we have a number of students that are coming from places that have experienced genocide and some were on the the victim side of that and some may have been on the perpetrator side of that and so think about that as well when you go into your classroom like the complexities of what you're presenting um, to your to your students and not that there's any kind of both sides that i'm talking about here but just sort of like you know you need to be aware of who's in your classroom and like what as much as you can what that experience was and how they're interpreting you know, their own history and what you're taking through that. And I think Carrie gave a really good example of like, you know, how we in the West see Rwandans genocide experience as, you know, has been packaged for us in a certain way. And then her experience of actually going there, even getting that small glimpse, like sort of reassesses her view of that, that, that genocide. So, you know, think about what that means for students coming from Iraq, students coming from Syria, et cetera. Et cetera. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to chime in? Okay, uh, on to the next question. Um, what images do you use most often with students instead of those that depict the graphic horrors of the Holocaust? I think, Carrie, you were addressing some of that. Yes, I was. Um, again, I try to make sure that it is something that doesn't show any sort of violence. The other thing I think about is I wouldn't, if. If this was a picture of my family member and it was showing a person who had passed or a person who was emaciated and um, looked, you know, just in a terrible state afterward, would I want that picture to be something <coughs> that was shown to the public at large? Um, and so I think about that. I think about um, images that don't, they may imply that violence is going to happen but not something that shows violence. One of the pictures that was in my slideshow was just in the one that talked about translating statistics to people was just suitcases. Um, there are lots of images like that that help you get the same idea across without being violent in some way or showing some sort of um, shocking content. And so the image, it depends on the lesson. Um, I can't speak to anything particular unless you give me a specific lesson, but just ones that don't show people in a state that I wouldn't want to be shown in. I guess that's how I think of it. Um, so that's my kind of overarching idea that I operate from. 
And I think to, to echo what um, Carrie was saying too, is we don't want to, we want our students to have a nuanced view. So we don't want to only depict um, Jew, uh, the, the Holocaust as, like you said, emaciated, vulnerable, near death people. We want to give a more broad perspective about what life was like during and most importantly before the Holocaust and even after the Holocaust, really. So. This next question um, is from a former student of mine. Uh, so here we go. To add on to Wendy's question, that was earlier, I think it was the first question I asked, uh, and Amit's response, is it relevant in a US history course to discuss how US Jim Crow and miscegenation laws were borrowed by Nazis to create the Nuremberg laws? Also, is it relevant to discuss the US's inaction and lack of response to the Holocaust? Yes. <laughs> 100% yes. Um, you can, I think this is one of the biggest challenges for teachers is how to make meaningful, insightful comparisons and connections without students automatically going to which one was worse. And it's your job as a teacher to talk them out of that and explain why that's not okay, how that doesn't lead to, um, to deeper meanings. And so, but yeah, 100%, a lot of the students that, I, I bring this up all the time with students on tours. This is very much part of what we do at, at the museum is specifically talk about our history here in this state and how that connects to other histories elsewhere. And so you brought up um, where Jews were not allowed to marry non-Jews, you know, black Oregonians were not allowed to marry white Oregonians until 1953. So that was after the Holocaust. And that's like, students have a real hard time grasping that. So yeah, a hundred percent do that, but talk to your students first about how to compare. And yeah, I would just say, yeah, and, do and that. The, the US Supreme Court did decide that, um, uh, you know, interracial marriage was okay until the loving decision of 1967. It even gets worse. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Carrie, you want to add anything? June, Amit, big question. Yeah, it is a really important question. and. Um, Amanda's right, of course, uh, we should. And then just thinking about the framing of that, um, you know, it's not just to compare different, you know, horrific acts that humans have done to each other, but um, in a US history course where um, we really are trying to like unpack um, the values that America says it holds, right? And how that then acts those things out. Oftentimes we'll look at something like slavery or if it's a, the second half of US history course, Jim Crow, um, and still sort of think about it as sort of like, well, that's in the South and that's sort of happened at a very specific time in a very particular region. Um, and so hopefully teachers are explaining the way that Jim Crow worked elsewhere in the United States. But the impact of, of those Jim Crow laws was really international when, it, when you bring in uh, something like the Nuremberg laws. Um, and so that's a really like, just a, I think an easy and important touchstone to, to say like, you know, what America does has this this impact, and, and what these, you know, these southern laws that we consider these southern laws really were much broader, not only in the U.S. but again globally. And so, yes, that should be covered. Also, that question about um, America's role, oftentimes, people were too. Oftentimes, um, if you ask students why we went to go to World War II, the answer will be something about rescue. Right to to stop the Holocaust, um, they've sort of picked that up through their uh, elementary and middle school experience. Um, we know that that was not even on the top twenty <laughs> reasons why uh, we went to war, um, and in fact avoided, of course, avoided actually doing much rescue during the war. So, um, so afterwards, that became sort of a, a reason to talk about it. Um, but I would I would want students to unpack that or teachers to help students unpack that as well, right? That there is some mythology around U.S. involvement in World War II um, that would be good to to look at. That is a PD that we'll most definitely have next year. Um, so the the USHMM has a fabulous virtual 
virtual um, virtual egg virtual exhibit um, up right now, and so it's all about our response to the Holocaust. And they have such great resources. They rely on Gallup polling, on newspapers. If you haven't looked there, um, they have un unfolding history, which is it's free to sign up and you can look at newspaper articles from all over the country to better understand how it was being covered in the US. And so Albany, I looked, Oregon has 306 articles that were submitted there. And I wanna say like 150 of them were from, from the Albany Gazette, I wanna say. Um, but they were from that area. So you can see right here in our state what people understood, but then also compare it to Florida or Montana. Yes, and you actually you can turn your students into uh, historians trying to search through newspapers that are local through History Unfolded. It's an amazing project and mm -hmm. it's wonderful. The other thing I was going to say, I'm not a history teacher, but anytime you can find crossover um, to connect to other parts of history, I think, is great. Same thing when you're talking about any genocide and you talk about tribal history um, here in Oregon and what happened here with Native Americans, it would be another great crossover to discuss. I know I discuss it in my class. I also discuss Nuremberg laws and Jim Crow. Um, so, and I'm not a history teacher, but I do it anyway. <laughs> so. um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a US history teacher, but I mean, I've, I've taught literature and I think it's, I mean, if our students are going to read To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, they're going to learn about Jim Crow laws. And it would be really strange to not mention that when there's such a direct relationship. And then we can fast forward to the modern day. I mean, what we're experiencing right now is so relevant to understanding Jim Crow laws. So it's all interconnected, even, you know, even if you don't teach that particular subject or topic. I, I just want to add another Oregon resource here. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carrie, you know, uh, Jeffrey Osler teaches at the University of Oregon, um, Surviving Genocide, Native Americans, the United States from the American Revolution of Bleeding Kansas, which is 1854. He's on, and work now on a second volume. Um, it's a very depressing read, to say the least. Here's a, another great question. At least I think so. Uh, have any of the educators used Mouse by Art Spiegelman as a class read? I responded directly to that one. Um, I use it in small groups. I haven't taught it as a whole class. Students really respond to it. They love graphic novels and um, they get a lot out of it. Most of them voluntarily read Mouse 2. Um, so that's always encouraging as a lit teacher for somebody that is often has reluctant readers when they pick up something on their own and want to continue that education. I think it's great. So I think Mouse is a, is a good resource to use in the classroom. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I used it. Uh, we had a couple class sets floating around um, when I was teaching. Great, great resource for the reasons Carrie said. Um, you know, it's, a, it's graphic novel, but it, it, it's not an easy read, right? There's really hard topics in there. So um, it, it really does do a nice job of sort of giving you a chance to talk about some of those things. Not about Mouse, um, but the museum partnered with the, the Multnomah County Multnomah County Library um, system. And they have uh, created like a spreadsheet type of thing where they have um, a chosen books that they have in their system that um, line up with the, the mandate. Right now, the books for K-5 are on their website, um, but they'll be adding the six through 12 books as well. It's not fully comprehensive. It's not every single book, but if you don't know where to start, that's a great place. And if you don't live in the county, you can still go and look at that list and then see what you have in your school or, or county library. Okay, um, here's another question. Will all rural as well as private and urban schools in Oregon be following the same Holocaust curriculum for grades one through 12, regardless of the school budget? Amanda, that's for you. <laughs> that's a you question to me. That's I mean, I, I have saying. this conversation all the time. Yeah, so, um, so the, the, the big answer is uh, all school districts, but not private, um, all public school K-12, We'll have to follow the same standards 
or in this case, the learning concepts um, or the SB 13 lessons. Those, those things are across the board, uh, big school, small school, rural, urban. Um, for curriculum, you know, or uh, people often mean like something like what's coming with SB 13, like actual lesson plans, questions that are provided, additional resources. That's not part of SB 13. Um, so we don't have something coming that is just like a grab and go teach. Um, instead, what we're doing is um, encouraging people to, to check out the resources that we've mentioned today. Um, teachers are getting trained. We will be identifying resources. Um, we already have a list of sort of supplemental resources that we use uh, to help teachers who aren't landing at uh, the museum. Um, and then when we do adopt these standards in, in 25, 26, um, we will identify instructional materials that teach to those standards. Right, so that you can use. In the past, that's always been textbooks, but I think, you know, five years down the line when we're doing these standards again, um, we probably won't be in a textbook only space. So things like facing history and, um, you know, other US Holocaust Museum, uh, international groups, uh, Yad Vashem's that were resources, all of those could be possibilities that could make it onto the list. We just don't know what the sort of the new rules are gonna be about um, digital uh, instructional materials. So, so that's coming, but it'll, it will, at least right now, there's nothing in the works to sort of say, here's the curriculum that you have to buy, or here's the curriculum that we're going to give you for free. We just sort of point with every other content area. So, yeah, the only other thing I want to add on to that is that these learning concepts were, the intention behind them was that students learn them at multiple points throughout their, their K-12 like learning um, years. So if you're teaching about the ramifications of, of, of racism, you're gonna do that in elementary school, in middle school, and in high school at different points in times with different histories. So we didn't want to have a curriculum aside that Oregon just doesn't really do that because you know your students best and each district has their own needs. So it needed to be flexible within that. Anybody else? Um, here's a question. Um, this is a tough one. I teach EL, 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 English language arts and the book Night. I love these great resources, but I have a very limited time in trying to pare it down. What would be the absolute musts I think it in part depends on your rationale for teaching it. Um, it also depends on what you're trying to focus on, the standards that you're using. Um, there's so much that it depends on. Um, and then there's so much out there. I have to pare it down when I teach night because I only get a very limited amount of time with my freshmen to go through it. And so um, I guess I would need more information. I definitely would do something with pre-Jewish life um, because so much of that um, so much of the history is students don't understand it. They think that it just kind of happened in isolation. And so I always do something with pre-Jewish life. I always do something about Nuremberg laws and kind of the progression of how things happen in that book. Um, and so it there's it's a hard question to answer, honestly. There are so many different things I could say about it. So I know I'm not being very uh, committed to anything, but um, it's such a broad question. <laughs> A great resource, I think, is, uh, you know, for, for a pre-Holocaust Jewish life in Europe is uh, Constantine's Sword by James Carroll. I used to use the chapter about Baruch Spinoza um, when I was a high school teacher. I, Carrie, I want to ask you a question. I, I, you have pulled something off that I, I wish lots of folks could pull off, and that is you teach a semester-long elective class of the Holocaust. Um, and I always felt when I was teaching middle school and high school that I was rushing through things all the time. And I never really got to uh, some of the major themes that I wanted to get to. Um, how do you lobby to get a standalone Holocaust class? And what can you tell teachers out there about how you pull this off? Um, honestly, it was just simply by proposing it and asking. I had a very supportive administration. Uh, I proposed the class before I'd been studying the Holocaust personally for 
probably about 10 years, not quite, I guess, um, and had been teaching about the Holocaust in my ninth grade class for eight years at that point. And I went to my administrator and I said, I really want to propose this class because it's something I feel very passionate about. And she said, propose it and let's see what site council does because they are the ones that approved our classes. And my school was on board and they saw that I was really eager to do this, that I was passionate about the subject and students were interested in it. And so I proposed the class and it was approved and I had two sections the next year because students really wanted to learn more about the subject. Um, and I had kind of, I guess, whetted their interest when they were freshmen and they wanted more. And it has just grown since then. I mean, like I said, it's been, it's now 10 years that I've been teaching that class. It's hard to believe. Um, and it just never goes away. It's always there. There's always the interest for it. And students, I think just have, um, if they know anything about genocide, if they know anything, if they've been exposed to the Holocaust, they want to understand how the world works and why these things happen. And um, I don't give them those answers in the class and I let them know I'm not going to, but they are curious about it. And so really it was, a lot of it has been driven by students having an interest in the class and continuing to be interested. But um, initially it was just me coming up with an idea and presenting it in my school supporting me. So I was very fortunate. Well, it's uh, 817 and uh, it's that time. I'd like to thank our, our speakers, uh, Amit Gabrowski, uh, Amanda Coven, June Morris, and uh, Kerry McCallum. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for making this night um, so special. Um, and uh, take care. And here's to meeting face to face next year in Corvallis. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, you've taught all of us, you know, so much. And I hope uh, everybody out there in the audience takes advantage of all the resources that are available out there to teach a crucial curriculum in, in, in impacting young people's lives. So good night, everybody. Take care, and thank you.